Hi beautiful people! I'm posting this conversation with Jamie Lee Finch because it is the perfect accompaniment to the video that I put out on Monday on Girl Defined. In that video, in defense of how I read the Bible, how I practice my faith, how I follow Jesus, I had to tell you guys more about the history of our evangelical faith because a lot of us were raised to believe that everything we're being taught in 2019 about God and the Bible is everlasting and unchanging, just like God himself. But in reality, when you dive into history, you realize that Christianity is much more complicated than that. Some things we believe about God are actually man-made doctrines. Some of these doctrines work and are edifying. Others are rooted in racism and are created by people that were really power hungry and motivated by things that are quite evil. And I know a lot of this may sound conspiratorial, and that's why I'm begging you guys to listen to this conversation. So the following podcast will be a fun history lesson. Jamie is amazingly informed on the moral majority as well as the roots of purity and sexual prosperity doctrine. If you care to listen to audio only, search the God is Great podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, and more. Also, please spark dialogue in the comments section. I'd love to see what you guys learn from this conversation, whether it be about the moral majority or about the health of your own mind, body, and soul. And that's it. I love you guys. Please like, subscribe, share with your friends, donate to my Patreon or Venmo if you can. God bless. Hi, beautiful people. Today we're talking to Jamie Lee Finch. She's the author of You Are Your Own, and she's a sexuality and embodiment coach. And did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am so excited to introduce you guys to Jamie because... We are kindred spirits. We have a very similar history. A lot of you guys will share this history with both of us um, coming out of evangelical church and we've both taken different life paths, um, etc. But we still see the world through the same lenses, I believe. And we've both gone through deconstruction. And if you don't know what that means, we're going to get into that as well. There's a lot of terminology I wanted to introduce you guys to that you may not be familiar with. And the reason it's so important to me to tell you guys about this is because You Are Your Own, Jamie's book, actually really laid out a lot of these things. And I found it so validating to be able to put a name to the religious trauma I experienced, to understand that it is actually being diagnosed as a certain form of PTSD. And it's just comforting to hear you are not insane and the things that we have survived, whether you came out remaining a Christian, whether you're in the process of it, wherever you are with it, something did happen to us <laughs> that I don't believe was divine or good in many ways. And we'll talk about the things that were good, but we're also going to talk about the things that were wretched. <laughs> good word for it. Wretched. <laughs> Um, so first I'd love for you to describe the book and what your intention was behind it and, you know, kind of what, you know, everything, what kind of audience you saw for it. It's a very great question. Cause that is something that I had to, I had to answer some form of that question over and over and over during the time that I was writing it because the context in which I was writing it was that it was for academic purposes at uh -huh. first. It was my thesis. So I had to get extremely clear on who my audience was. And the academic advisors I was working with directly for all intents and purposes were not that audience. They were one generation older than us. They were, neither of them were American and neither of them had any sort of religious background. Wow. <laughs> so when I'm trying to explain things and tell my personal stories or even explain some of the aspects of the subculture or the cultural phenomenon involved in even American evangelical Christianity. There was a lot that they were asking me to flesh out or explain, or even in some cases like leave out because they didn't think it quite fit or made sense that I really had to fight for to leave in mm. and just ask them to trust me that I was like, I appreciate all your direction. And also you're not really who I'm writing this for because really who I'm writing this for are people who came from the same background as me, um, or similar backgrounds as me. Um, a lot of people, our age, um, 
people who know exactly who I'm talking about when I say the name James Dobson, like mm-hmm. those people. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like there's definitely, while I understand that it evangelicalism, American evangelicalism is a subculture of Christianity, um, a very distorted subculture of Christianity, just because it's a subculture doesn't mean it's a small amount of people. There's mm-hmm. millions of people. It's definitely not background. a quiet subculture. It is either. not a quiet subculture. Mm-hmm. They exist and they want us to know that and they exist. Loud and proud. <laughs> Very much so. Especially the white old men in power mm-hmm. of, of that subculture. So, um, yeah, it's for people who came from that background. That's my, that's my background. Um, I've had a touch point pretty much every possible version of evangelical Christianity that you can have. I was raised Southern Baptist originally, um, and then left that at a certain point to go to the cooler church, Mm -hmm. um, in my neighborhood that all the kids in my Christian school, because of course went to, and that was like a non-denominational church. I was in Presbyterian Christian school for a bit, went to Presbyterian church, dabbled in Catholicism for a little while did some reformed theology, Acts 29, Mark Driscoll type stuff, and then found my way into more charismatic expressions like the International House of Prayer in Kansas City and Bethel and places like that. So I've kind of run the whole gamut. So I feel (laughs) like I, I, as far as I can remember from writing the book, I feel like I've referenced some, some experience of every one of those, um, points of reference. So I feel like it would resonate with many people. That's incredible. Yeah. I love thinking of like divine destiny too, of, mm. you know, that even if who knows how fate works, etc. but it seems like you've been studying to write this book your mm-hmm. entire life. I deeply feel that way now. Interesting. Thank you for saying that and seeing that because <laughs> yeah. I really, it's not that I really want to give credit to my trauma for, um, because I feel like that would be on some level kind of disrespectful to my body and validating like her traumatic experience. But I, yeah, it feels like I was gathering information and doing like field studies without knowing it for most of my life. And I didn't know, I think what I knew on a deep level is like, this will be impactful. What I'm experiencing and living through will be impactful in some way. Um, but clearly I probably was thinking about it in a very different context than what I'm thinking about it now. I love it. I love when things change like that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Speaking of change, I really wanted to highlight the beginning of the book, which Mm -hmm. is so fascinating. And I really want to do more videos about this because Mm -hmm. a lot of us in evangelicalism are coming out of it, et cetera, don't know the history that we've come from Mm -hmm. and don't know how recently a lot of our history exists. Mm -hmm. For example, the word homosexual not appearing in the Bible until the 1940s. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're told something with so much authority from a pulpit, you think or are led to believe that this is the way it is and God is now forever and eternal Mm -hmm. and it's always been this way. Always been this way. Mm -hmm. But guess what, guys? (laughs) It's not. And a lot of this stuff is very recent and unfortunately, a lot of it, and this is not conspiratorial, you can look it up, you can Mm -hmm. research it yourself, it has roots in racism Mm -hmm. and obviously we know the misogyny and stuff, Mm -hmm. but... um, could you explain like the racist roots of fundamentalism and how a lot of this began with segregation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was something that I actually didn't. And this is a testament to how well kept of a secret it is. Um, I didn't even know a lot of this until about six months to a year into studying and writing this book itself. And this is my background. This is what I came from. Um, Two of the biggest things that come to mind that I know I I touched on in the book, uh, when I think about the racist background of white evangelical Christianity, um, the first one being that I didn't realize that the Southern Baptist denomination itself, um, how it was created in the first place is that When the abolitionist movement started in the United States um, during the time of the Civil War, uh, there were, and rightfully so, a number of pastors and preachers and um, people in ministry positions um, across the U.S., particularly the southern U.S., that started to hop on board with the abolitionist movement. There were also, unfortunately, 
a lot of good God fearing plantation owners Hmm. that did not want to hear their pastors talk about the abolition of Hmm. slaves um, and the full, you know, humanization of people that they did not see to be human. So um, there was a specific pressure that was put on a lot of Southern preachers in particularly the Baptist denomination, apparently, um, to intentionally avoid speaking about abolition. Um, and that caused a problem for a number of the preachers who did not feel comfortable with that. And essentially the solution, and this is all like a super oversimplification. I go into it more in the book, but, um, and there, and I also cite a resource in the book, uh, this article by Chris Ladd, who goes really deep into this. Yeah, I love it. You guys really need to buy this book because you'll learn so much and it's easy and entertaining to read too, even though the material is really dense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I worked really hard on that too. So thank you. Oh yeah, no, it's very accessible. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it caused this split and that essentially is how, um, the Southern Baptist denomination itself started, um, was because their intention was to remain, um, of the ideology that uh, the divine or God was not for abolition. Um, now, again, we don't know if that's really what they thought or if they just had a vested interest in, you know, maintaining uh, their positions as being slaveholders. But um, finding that out later down the road, even years after, you know, leaving evangelicalism, that that was the history of the spiritual specific branch of the institution that I came up in was both shocking and also not that shocking at the same time. Because Mm. when I look back on my experience growing up in evangelicalism, it was almost exclusively white folks in those pews alongside me. And I look again, I look back at that now and I'm like, that's strange and that's a problem but it was something that because of the context I was in was never presented to me as being strange or a problem. Um, yeah. And so then the other thing, as far as like the history, the racist history of a lot of what we know to be evangelical Christianity now and just how affiliated it is with, um, conservative political ideology. Um, again, something I didn't know for a long time. A lot of us, I think, uh, have been fed the talking points that good, again, God fearing, Christian Republican folks, they really care about the lives of the unborn and abortion is their primary issue. Um, But if you dig enough into uh, Jerry Falwell's creation of the moral majority, um, which is what directly led to the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency, um, you actually see that they hopped on the bandwagon of abortion being their issue that they believed that they could use to politically motivate um, the most amount of people to achieve their purposes um, because really what they were upset about and why they wanted to elect a conservative president is because um, they were coming under uh, the institutions, the private Christian institutions and colleges that they had started and were in charge of and making a lot of money from um, basically were being threatened to uh, that if they didn't integrate because they were segregated, if they didn't integrate, there were certain taxes that were going to be imposed upon them. And that was unacceptable, which is gross in two ways, that they didn't want to pay certain taxes and they didn't want to actually integrate their schools. So clearly it tells you what they feel most protective of, which is whiteness and money slash power. So um, they, on some level, realized that that was probably not going to go over well and actually get them the votes that they wanted and needed and gain the traction that they wanted and needed. And so they galvanized this very at the time, very strange issue to decide to hop in the, you know, to create into this major problematic issue because for many years, um, during the time of Roe v. Wade and in the immediate aftermath of Roe v. Wade being passed, it was actually, uh, Catholic clergy who were most in support of abortion rights and other religious people who were most in support of abortion rights. So if you really start to dig into this history, um, it is not quite as cut and dry as, well, the good people want to save the lives of the unborn babies and the bad people don't. It actually has, like I said, everything to do with um, preserving whiteness and preserving money and power. Um, And many of us have been not just lied to, but 
I would definitely use the word, and I do use the word in the book, indoctrinated into believing things that are so untrue, but uphold these institutions to be able to continue to do such harmful things. Um, and I feel like that is something that I don't think, well, definitely not back in the creation of the Southern Baptist denomination and likely not at the time of the creation of the moral majority, they didn't know the internet was coming. So they didn't know (laughs) that at some point we were going to find you out. And I do think that's a big reason why you see a lot of people leaving now because they're able to, um, it's one of the things I wrote about in the book is in this research, all the research I was doing, I didn't even realize that I had been lied to so often, not just about these, the core motivation of these issues, but also like the scope of influence that these seemingly powerful men claim to have in the government and in the world. And really they largely exaggerated their own power. And I didn't realize that there had been so many dissenting voices um, within Christendom for so long saying, this is not the way of Jesus. This is Mm -hmm. not the way of the Christ. This is the way of empire. This is the way, honestly, the way of evil. Um, I had been fed a very one sole narrative which is not only that this is what God wants, but God has blessed us so much and we have all this power and influence to do it. And no one is speaking against us because no one can. And none of that is true. Yeah. Thank you for articulating that so beautifully. I mean, Mm. yes, that sums it up. And it's thanks to people like you that have put in the hard work of dredging up all this information Mm -hmm. that now you can honestly just do cursory research and find this out. Mm -hmm. You can just quick Google search. It's right there. Oh yeah. Yeah, So just like put, put yourself to the task. If Mm -hmm. you think anything we're saying is, is bananas Mm -hmm. because it sounds bananas. It sounds like the craziest conspiracy ever, but it's just reality. Yep. And, um, and I think this is, or I know this is what blows everyone's mind so much, especially I think Christians tend to internalize their feelings over it because like you said we've been indoctrinated to believe that our founding fathers came here Mm -hmm. and our nation was founded on God Mm -hmm. and therefore you know God has blessed us always Mm -hmm. for upholding this Mm -hmm. meanwhile again you can do a cursory research of some of our founding fathers and they slaveholders, yeah. they were not just supportive of, but celebratory of native genocide. Yeah. Like there's, yeah, it's not yeah. as simple as what we were taught. <laughs> so you're like, yeah. yeah, I don't really see Jesus's uh-huh. fingerprint on that, Yeah, but whatever you guys say, fine. So we've been indoctrinated into that. And I think when you're still sitting in the pew, watching the news, you know, on the other side at your Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. table with family members that are arguing with you about these things. It's just so good. You're like, wait, what is, how does this have anything to do with Jesus? Mm -hmm. How does this feel? Mm -hmm. Where's this cognitive dissonance come from in myself? Like, and also where is Christ in this? Mm -hmm. I don't see him. Yeah. And I think it's, And then it also confuses atheists and agnostics and any outsiders. Like so many people, now that I have this platform, Mm. are all coming up to me at like a bar when I'm out with friends and like, can you explain to me? Yeah. Like, because they're fascinated. They're like, what does Jesus have to do with, you know, why would people embrace Trump? For example, that's always the biggest question. It's literally why the opening of my book is like, look, y'all, let's just get it out of the way. Like when I tell people what I do for a living or what I had been researching and writing in this book, the question I got from, I got very specific feedback from fellow former Christian people and even some still current Christian people, which was kind of this note of understanding. But every person I interacted with that was utterly non-religious had the same question, which is, can you explain Donald Trump to me? Yeah. And I was like, I kind of can. Yeah. Like the white evangelical support of Donald Trump I hate to tell you that I can't explain this to you, but I can explain this to you because I see exactly how it happened. Yeah. And I've read statistics that are available that um, a lot of people were willing to compromise their morality and their votes of him and his immoralities Mm -hmm. that are just like on his sleeve that you can see. Mm -hmm. And that's not even a judgment. It's just like... He talks about it very (laughs) celebratory. So yeah, we're just repeating what he has already said. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're just like, it just, there's no, you know, a man with multiple wives, man with multiple like adultery scandals, whatever. Why were they willing to compromise? And it's Mm -hmm. because they saw it as 
there is greater good in this. I will accept this evil or I will accept this compromise mm-hmm. as long as we save the babies, as long as we right. protect our country, whatever narrative it is that they hold on to, to mm-hmm. justify that. Yep. And, um, and it's wild because you and I, before we started recording, we're talking about Christ consciousness mm-hmm. and the psychedelic nature of the world mm-hmm. and the beauty of, you know, the tree that's outside of my house right mm-hmm. now. And that's what we're supposed to be focusing mm-hmm. on. This, this capitalism, greed, mm-hmm. corruption, it just poisoned the well of what we would truly believe. And it is so not of Christ that it's baffling to me how anyone could think that it is of Christ because depending on what you believe about the Bible or scripture, if you believe that those are the words of the Christ, it doesn't take much to read those words and realize that capitalism itself is very anti-Christ. Yeah. That white supremacy is anti Christ, Mm -hmm. that misogyny is anti Christ. So it's, and that I feel like is the core of the question from a lot of, that a lot of people are holding in their bodies and particularly people in a lot of the people I talk to in my coaching work, folks in our generation who are looking at our parents who raised us apparently with these values and then elected enthusiastically this man that does not hold any of those values. And we're here trying to reconcile how on earth that happened because the que- the largest question in my body when I think about my relationship with my dad in particular is you showed me this certain picture. There's a picture of who of you, like who I thought you were, according to who you told me that you were, according to what was important to you. And I thought that that was following Jesus. And I thought that that was everything that went along with following Jesus. And yet when I point out to you the character of this person that you enthusiastically elected, you're coming up with some response as to exactly what you said, some sort of like, well, there's a greater good, a a better good, a a whatever. And then when I asked my dad things like, you know, after Charlottesville, I texted him to ask him if his pastor had said the words white supremacy from the pulpit Mm. that morning. And his response, I mean, we got into it more after this, but I was just shocked by his initial response to me, which was no, why? He just was utterly unaware. One of the main things that happened for me in leaving, finally leaving evangelicalism was after, um, the verdict came down that the police officer that shot Michael Brown was found not guilty of any charges. And it was a Monday night, which was like the young adult night of the church I was in at the time. And Mm -hmm. I was in the back. It was super charismatic. Everyone's really flowing during the two hour long worship (laughs) set. And I was sobbing. And in that context, usually people think you're crying because you're being like moved by the spirit. I was not. Well, That's arguable. Maybe I was for (laughs) what I was crying over. But this woman came over to me who was like a leader and a fellow like white woman, because I mean that everybody at that church is white. And she came over and she was like, what's going on? Probably assuming that I was going to tell her about something I was being convicted of. Or I was like, God's just beautiful. Right? Oh, I'm my sexual <laughs> sin. They had heard plenty about that one, which we could get into. But we, um, we are getting into Oh, that. we are. <laughs> and But in this at this current moment, what was causing me to cry was the depth of that injustice. And when she came over and asked what was wrong, and I just told her straight up, I was like, this is what happened. He was found not guilty. Similar thing as my dad. She looked at me and she goes, who is that? And it was this, I had this abrupt shift in that moment where I saw the room I was in completely differently. And I was like, why am I here? Why are any of us here? We're all in this charismatic setting. We're all praying for revival. We're praying for the kingdom. We're praying for this change. And suddenly I was aware of this like very egocentric experience of what we were all doing. We were all in that room because we wanted to feel good, feel better, feel great, leave, come back tomorrow and do it all over again. Meanwhile, no one here is concerned about the systemic issues that are actually going on. And if they are concerned at all, they're concerned about it from this perspective of they don't want to lose ground. And for them, losing ground was eight years of a Obama presidency. So it was just, there was, there was, I started to see their layers started to get peeled back. The more I felt moved in certain causes of justice by arguably Christ consciousness by the Christ. And I was in these religious spaces and I was like, I'm apparently the only one who even knows about any of this going on. 
I think we could do an entire podcast on this. Yeah. And I want to move on. But I'd like to say in conclusion, like, thank you for articulating all Mm -hmm. that so beautifully. Also, everyone, please buy the book and really dive in. Because I think that it's just so important to understand where we've come from. And it's really going to help you guys clarify any time where you were really confused and lost and experiencing all of the confusion that comes mm-hmm. with this and to help you embrace the fact that it hasn't always been this way mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be this way anymore. Yeah. We don't have to hold on to, we don't have to hold on to power like this. Mm-hmm. If you believe in God, he's the power. You can mm-hmm. like, let it go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you were raised Southern Baptist primarily. Mm-hmm. Is that where the majority of your sexual anxiety came from? Or what church brought you all of that? All of them. But yeah, <laughs> it started there for sure. It was, and during my formative years, it was definitely the Southern Baptist church and then the irony of the non-denominational church, which is its own denomination. denomination yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had a touch point in like both of those churches. And then my Christian school that I went to is tiny and not accredited hardly an actual school and also probably would be classified as Mm non-denominational um but there was as far as the ideas of like purity culture and um what I was and was not supposed to do and how I was and was not supposed to interact with my own sexuality it was pretty much common thread throughout and it was it was pretty and I mean that continued on into my you know teens and early 20s Um, no matter what expression I was in, it was pretty much the same story over and over, which is that your sexuality is not allowed to be any part of your identity until the day that you get married, enter into a monogamous, lifelong, committed, legal marriage with a person the opposite gender of you, Mm -hmm. Um, which felt like a tall order considering that I was not entirely straight couldn't tell myself that was not super interested in marriage couldn't tell myself that and also was like 12 and so (laughs) um, (laughs) marriage at the very least is not coming for a while so there it just creates this and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here it Mm -hmm. creates this deep unavoidable anxiety yeah because you are what you don't know at the time is that you are doing the most normal human thing which is you are growing and evolving and your sexuality is a part of that, but you are being inundated with this ideology telling you you're in danger if you interact with that part of you at all until you reach this certain point, which at best is maybe like 10 years down the road, right. which is super inhumane. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. I always talk about um, compartmentalization because mm. I, I feel like it's the only way you survive that time. Yes. yes. And I use survive, like I see survival as like, crawling away from Freddy Krueger, like bleeding all over the place. Like, yes. Cause you don't come out of that healthy and whole. Whole. You have to do so much work. No matter what you're altered in some way when you come out of that. And they're formative years too. Those years are supposed to be the time where you're allowing your body to change and grow and you're embracing the changes. And my dream, like I told you earlier, is to like revolutionize sex ed in Mm -hmm. not only church, but in America in general, because it's a disaster. Um, but, and it's also why the world goes round and why you're standing in that church because two people banged. It's the most normal thing (laughs) in the world on some level, restricting it so intensely is elevating it to a position that is also kind of warped. Because sexuality is just a normal part of being a human. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say something to the effect of for how much that evangelicals like don't want you to have sex. They're certainly obsessed with it. Uh Like they process everything through the lens of like even the Billy Graham rule. Like you can't be alone in a room with a woman. Why? Because you've instantly made her into a sexual object. The moment that you've said that if I'm in your presence, I'm going to think about fucking you. Like that's, you don't have to. I invite you to not (laughs) have to think that way. I can just be a person and you can just be a person. But this this sexual suppression actually, I think, results in a lot of cases and situations, this like hypersexuality where you're seeing the world through this over-sexualized lens in almost everything you're looking at. Absolutely. It was like all, one of the only things I could possibly think about for years. Mm-hmm. It just inundates your whole mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if this ever happened to you. It's happened to a lot of people I've spoken to but I found myself in a position when I was like 22 or 23 where just because I was thinking about sex at all, which 
for anyone out there, super normal thing to think about at any age, much less 23 years old. I thought just thinking about it at all meant I was a sex addict. (sighs) Yeah. It's, that's crazy. Yeah. What did you have in here? Oh, hating yourself, finding yourself weak for wanting. Mm -hmm. That's something that you say in the book. And I do get letters about that Mm. of, of women primarily. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true. Men write me a lot about masturbation Yeah, and women write me a lot about just being terrified or or amazed that they even desire. They're like, I'm so sorry that I desire. Mm. And it's like, so you're sorry you went through puberty. So you're sorry your body is doing the normal reactionary thing that it is it's like sorry you got hungry sorry you got thirsty it's exact it's the exact same I agree with that Mm -hmm. yeah I think it it disrupts our relationship towards desire and pleasure across the board not just as it relates to sexuality and that's the other mind-blowing thing to me that church completely 100% neglects the concept of pleasure Mm -hmm. it's all pain repentance Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm inherent evil within yourself yep and also it's always blown my mind that if we are having classes even these like premarital classes that completely unqualified people oh yeah lead for people that are about to get married yep. you're not telling the fiance man about a clitoris mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. how to pleasure his wife. A lot of times you're not telling the woman about her clitoris either. No. She didn't really know it's there either because if she got some really poor sex ed, yeah. she might not have even been told about the fact that she has that part of her body, mm-hmm. that, that part of her body exists in the first place. And it's so mind blowing because it's like, even in the Bible, uh, when it says there is a time for everything, a season mm-hmm. for everything, and there's like, there's joy and pain, mm. there's pleasure and pain, there's, but there's mm. always that dichotomy constantly. Yep. Why are we focusing on the negative and the horror and like yeah. crawling our way into heaven yep. instead of being like, wow, this is a delicious chocolate sundae. Like, yeah. thank you for creating my taste buds. Yes. And what a pleasure it is to enjoy this. Yep. Mm-hmm. If only we were taught that about our sexuality. I... The further I get away from that ideology, the more I'm confused about why we're not like truly confused about why we're not taught about that. Because there's a part of me I can access in my brain where I'm like, oh, well, I'm sure that they believe that if they gave us permission to interact with our pleasure and get to know our pleasure and develop a relationship to pleasure, we would become these insatiable sexually driven which is what I thought about myself for entirely too long these like sexually driven deviants who could not function in the world apart from just wanting to fuck everything that moves but the problem is so first of all that's not true (laughs) yeah second of all the problem with that is is that if you don't give people the opportunity to learn what their relationship is towards pleasure indulgence is almost always going to follow restriction yeah. So that's the thing. And I, I have so many people, friends and clients who, when I'm working with them and we're talking about, yes, as it relates to their sexuality, their relationship to pleasure and desire, but also so many other areas of their life where they will express something to me about how they're concerned that they might be over indulging or indulging too much in something that brings them joy. Or even the question of how will I know when slash if I've gone too far? And I'm like, you've got, you're learning your relationship with your body kind of for the first time, um, I feel like I went through puberty actually, like in my mid twenties, like really had the puberty I never got to have. And that's a lot of people's experience. And my advice essentially is like, I don't think you need to worry ahead of time about whether or not you're going to do this wrong. You are figuring out what your body innately knows that you were lied to about, which is that your body, your body can regulate you. Your body knows when pleasure is moving into, because indulgence is almost like cycling back over into pain again. Yeah. And it also causes the pleasure and what you are experiencing as pleasurable to kind of lose, lose some aspect of what makes it pleasing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think often about my background with my eating disorder and my relationship to, um, binge eating. And, um, I don't know exactly how I feel about the terminology of food addiction, but I did go through a 12 step program for food addiction. And I see it very linked, inextricably linked to what I was taught in the evangelical world about sexual ethics and, uh, what I was allowed to engage with and not engage with as it directly relates to pleasure and desire. 
because it was very much this feeling of, um, I, I never got to learn how to regulate my own or, or learn my own body's cues about fullness. Yeah. And when desire felt complete, when desire felt like it had been obtained and there was an enoughness to it that I didn't need to keep going. And unfortunately in my relationship with my body for many years, I pushed her past the point where she felt comfortable or even safe and just kept going because I had never learned how to really healthily engage with pleasure. So it took a long time to unlearn that way of being, learn how to trust my body and learn how to engage with pleasure in a way that feels not just healthy, but enlivening. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I talk to people, whether they're referring to like a sexual context or otherwise, um, I kind of, I, I tell them on some level, when you think about when the pendulum has been on one side and that's been restriction for so long, it's likely not just going to find the middle ground without I swinging to the other side. I literally talk about this all the time. Yeah. It's actually really important. Yeah. There, cause there's, yeah, it's the perfect visual too, because there's no such thing as calmly centering yourself yes. and being a whole per like mm -hmm. you have to go to the other side. Yeah, you do. And you know what? That's not even the worst thing that can possibly happen. It's not. It's actually part of your, like, it's the most human thing in the world to go to the other side. And we don't need to be afraid of just being human. Yeah. And I was uh, interviewing Pete Enns, another great author you mm. guys need to read. He wrote um, How the Bible Actually Works. He's like, if you can't fathom that God loves you, mm. just imagine he likes you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Just imagine that God made you as yeah. a human being yeah. and that's okay with yes. him. Yes. So all of your human instincts, like, can we stop hating ourselves mm -hmm. for just having a desire, just having an instinct, yep. just wanting something? They're there on purpose. Yeah. Man, I, that even feels revolutionary to me <laughs> to just it? sit yeah. with that idea of what if the divine didn't fuck up? when they created those human aspects of you as well. Yeah. And your life here in this body is not supposed to be about unlearning those or killing those, as I was often told to like kill the flesh. Mm. Your life here is not to learn how to kill those, but likely to fully embrace them and learn about them and learn from them. Yeah. And when we see the flesh as the enemy, which mm -hmm. I think most of us in evangelicalism were taught to believe that our body is the enemy. Yep. Even our mind is the enemy mm -hmm. and our whole life is going to be this battle mm -hmm. between mind and body versus this ethereal spirit right. that's just perfect. Yep. And I do believe we have that ethereal spirit that is near perfect. And I do believe our, ba our battle is within our humanity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, then wouldn't the conclusion be that we're here to figure out how to embrace our spiritualism in the midst of our humanity yes, and not yep. to kill it all the time, yep. not to make an enemy of it, yep. not to hate it. I think that word you said earlier about compartmentalization, which I feel is very similar, if not the same thing as dissociation. Yeah. Um, feels like it's created this. I love everything about what you just said. And I feel like the opposite of it is what we were taught where you create this false dichotomy yeah. where you have to dissociate from your body altogether in order for your spirit to flourish mm -hmm. rather than finding yourself in this space where your spirit is flourishing in the midst of and arguably because of slash at the same time as the flourishing of your body yeah mm -hmm. i agree i completely agree yeah. um what else do i want to ask you about well <laughs> you mentioned that you used to have actual panic and anxiety attacks about hell mm -hmm. as a child and you all know by now that I'm pregnant and I've really been thinking mm -hmm. about how insane it would be to tell my beautiful mm -hmm. innocent brand new to the world child to be concerned with eternal damnation yeah. it yep. sounds like child abuse to me <laughs> so let's dive into why it actually <laughs> is child that. abuse. Yeah. It's crazy. Yes. Um, man, it's a sensitive, it's so a sensitive because I have family members who are still raising their children, as far as I know, in agreement with hell existing. And so if it exists, there are people who can slash are going there. And so I'm assuming that they're raising them also to believe that you have the potential to be one of those people. Um, I don't know 
the specific trappings of how that message is being delivered. So it's really hard for me. It's hard. It's just on a personal level, hard for me to go full bore as much as I want to objectively and say that that's child abuse and that's abusive, even though I'm like, it is, <laughs> it, I mean, it's so, yeah. So it's just, it's tough, but well, from your experience. And I don't think I would have labeled it as that either. Mm-hmm. It just imagining though, like I was, I keep telling people I want, kind of want to do a skit with a com- like comedian friend or something and be like talking to a pastor about like, when do you think it's an appropriate time to tell my infant that, uh, he's going to burn in hell for mm-hmm. masturbating, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like what age? when is the appropriate <clears throat> yeah. time to yep. tell your child they're going to burn in hell for masturbating. Right. And anyone that's, you know, got their feathers ruffled about me, you know, am I questioning the existence of hell, et cetera. It's not even about that to me. It's mm-hmm. like, for me, the older I get, the more I'm like, I know nothing at all. And yeah. I actually find that beautiful. Yeah. And yep. you were talking about a big part of reconstruction. Mm-hmm. If you choose to take that path, which I did, is just acknowledging that you don't have to know everything. And it's actually beautiful to be Mm -hmm. like, I don't need to know the most majestic, ethereal, crazy concepts of the entire universe that are just completely unknowable Mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You're like allowed to calm yourself and be present in the moment with the divine. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, I can't wrap my head around hell. I will not lie and say, you know, I'm like, yeah, I have a hard time believing that any of my friends is going to burn in eternal damnation because they didn't say his name in time. Yep. Yes, that is hard for me to wrap my head around. No, that doesn't actually sound like Jesus to me. Right. But I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't exist. However, I would say I do think it's inappropriate Mm -hmm. in my mind to be telling my child that that's something he should worry about his whole life. Yep. And I feel like the thing that often went missed, either because my parents just were missing it or I didn't know how to articulate it as a seven-year-old, surprise, surprise, about my panic over that. Um, I think my parents, again, were kind of, yeah, probably processing it through the lens of this all being a team sport, like there's winners and losers. And I think that they interpreted my panic and anxiety um, in a way... I think they thought that I was concerned that I would be one of the losers and that I was afraid of going to hell. And so the way in which they would reassure me um, when I was a kid trying to sleep at night and it would wake me up and I'd freak out (laughs) almost every night. Wow. I think the way in which they would try and reassure me was by telling me, oh, honey, you're not going there. But my whole thing that I remember, again, I don't know if I ever articulated it, but I remember vividly holding these thoughts in my body the thing that I was mostly concerned about was less about me and more about the fact that I was like, but we know so many people Mm. and you have told me about your family members and I have friends at school. I have, we know people that you are telling me if all this is true, they might go there. And what's that love? Right. That was confusing. And then that led to like a massive anxiety during my formative years to want to like share the gospel and panic if I didn't. And then when I would further explain that anxiety or that fear and that guilt over not doing the adequate work to save all these people, I was met with this response from my parents that I was, oh, honey, calm down. You're taking it too seriously. I was like, (laughs) what am I missing? How can you guys even sleep at night? Yeah. I think it's less weird that I can't sleep at night <laughs> and more weird that you seem fine with all of this Wow! and you have siblings and friends and uh, my brother. So one child at the time who like didn't believe any of this. And I was like, I don't understand why you're not up in the middle of the night, just like me. I also don't understand why you're telling me I'm taking this too seriously like which is it one or the other you can have both I love that you're saying this because I've never even really thought about that but it's true Mm -hmm. we should be like if you really believe that you should be running through the streets screaming on some level the only evangelicals I actually have respect for are the people that we think are the crazy street preachers I have a soft spot for them too. Because if they're the only ones I think that are taking the idea of eternal conscious torment seriously. Yeah. And my heart goes out. I'm like, I'd see their anxiety being given yeah. unto other people. Yes. But you're like, yeah, thank you for putting in the work of what you profess to believe. If this place is real, mm-hmm. I could not have a job either. I would be out on the street holding this sign with that bullhorn 
because it would be so important to me to make sure people don't go there. Yeah. So important. And because again, you're going back to love, yes, which is all Jesus talked about. Yep. Um, so this kind of brings me to the idea of that we all have this inherited, inherent, depraved state of being mm-hmm. that we need to be ashamed of on a daily basis and we're fighting constantly to reject, mm-hmm. um, which is why we fear hell in the, in, mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. So the, the, prin- the principle, I guess, of our faith supposedly is that we're all hell bound and the only way to do that is to reject the flesh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you talk a bit about what you've learned in your work and talking to other people and within your own body of just considering yourself mm-hmm. this inherently flawed, sinful, awful creation? Yeah. I mean, it's the reason why I not only allowed and tried to explain away the abuse I received from other people, but it's also the reason why I then in turn started to harm my own self. Um, I couldn't, and again, I didn't know this at the time, but I couldn't reconcile why I should or could or would be even safe to treat myself kindly Mm. if everything in me that was me, that wasn't you know, covered by the blood of Jesus, everything in me that was me is supposed to be wretched and evil and bad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in my specific situation, that was combined with having an abusive mother. And that's something I go into in the book as well, where it was, you know, I I realized at a certain point when I was writing the book that I wasn't going to be able to tell the truth about why I recognize so clearly the impact of religious trauma and religious abuse on my life without telling the truth about being a survivor of parental abuse because Mm -hmm. these common threads, whereas in realizing the impact and then the attempt to heal from, um, the abuse from my mother was everything I was reading and studying about abuse and trauma and recovery. It was this, it was parallel lines. And I was like, oh, so you're telling me my religion was as abusive as my mom. Got it. Well, that's how I know what abuse is, is because of her. And so I can see that very clearly as like this being abusive too. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately that did lead to a lot of, um, the, the trauma response that I had, um, which would be, you know, anything fight, flight, freeze, fawn, um, I responded to things that were legitimately abusive with these survival tactics and then further told myself that I was the problem and I brought it on myself and it's all my fault. Um, Because unfortunately, those ideas from the theology that I'd been given that you deserve nothing, your flesh is bad, the only good things about you are the things that God has redeemed, um... You are bound for hell if nothing intervenes and nothing, you know, fixes you, particularly as it related to my sexuality, for sure. Um, I, it's not necessarily that I had the ability to not give permission for harmful things to happen to me, but what I didn't do is tell the truth to my own self about the fact that I was being abused, I was being harmed, and that was the problem of the other person or the system that I was in. What I did instead, which is why I believe religious trauma needs to be taken very seriously and these harmful religious ideologies need to be taken seriously is because what I did is I further harmed myself inside my own mind by telling myself that, oh, well, this pain I'm experiencing is just, or this abuse I'm experiencing is just punishment and punishment from whoever I view to be my authority, that whoever it is that I believe God put in authority over me, well, that's just discipline and discipline as my Bible tells me, is the way that my God loves me. So pain was punishment, punishment was discipline, and discipline was love. So all pain was love. And that is what I think is the most harmful aspect of all of this. When you start from this foundation of you are wretched, you are bad, you are sinful, you are dirty, you deserve nothing, then anything that happens to you that is harmful, is painful, is punishment you tell yourself, well, that's what I deserve. And then anything that attempts to come your way that is beauty and goodness and love. Also, you get a really warped view of what love is in the first place. But anything good that comes to you, 
and I can't speak for everyone, but for me, it took some really good therapy for a number of years to actually even be able to feel love and joy in my body at all. I was so dissociated because of my experience with my religious upbringing. Um, it didn't feel safe to feel good feelings in my body because yeah. I thought I was one step away from that slippery slope of being deceived and going to hell. Um, because the only framework I had for my relationship with God is that, well, God wants me to be better all the time. And so God, God's love is his discipline. So if I'm not feeling in pain and punished, then I must not be safe. Beautifully put. I mean, yeah, that, that sums up everything Mm -hmm. in a couple paragraphs. Yeah. I think that that's very relatable to a lot of people. And I think it's really fascinating that you have the backstory mm-hmm. of the abuse from your mom. Again, that brings me back to the idea that it's like you've been training for this ministry, or I could call it, your yeah. whole life. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, how do you think people can identify abuse mm-hmm. in their congregations or in their worlds in this you know, aspect? How do we start recognizing religious trauma? And this, by the Mm. way, for you guys listening, is a portion that I really want you to hear because Mm. Jamie is giving words to, I mean, I'm sure they've been coined by more Mm -hmm. people than yourself, but like there's terminologies for this now. And like I said, it's been recognized as genuine PTSD Mm -hmm. in a diagnosable way, Mm -hmm. religious trauma. So yeah, how do we recognize it when we're in it? This is another reason why I'm really happy that the internet exists. Um, Mm -hmm. This is something that I did another podcast interview a few days ago and she zeroed in on this one thing where what I believe is partly, if not mostly responsible for the exodus that we're seeing from like people leaving the evangelical institution. Which is massive. Massive. Massive exodus. I think there's many reasons for it. And I, what I think is that the main reason for it is our increase in trauma literacy Mm. to where people previously, people didn't really understand what trauma was, what could qualify as trauma, the, what the impact of trauma is. I think a lot of people thought trauma is what veterans experience in, or what people, soldiers experience in combat and what veterans have now, or trauma is when something impacts your body in an, an alterable way after a car accident. There were these really extreme ideas of trauma. And what we know now about what trauma is, is trauma is anything that creates within you, within your lived experience and the organism that you are, creates within you um, an internal experience that you can't, where you feel threatened and you can't escape it. So when I think about my entire experience in those pews as a little, you know, Southern Baptist, that felt sense of threat of you are bad and there's nothing you can do about it. Hell exists and you might go there. Like all these things that felt, they were ideologies that I was given that were felt threatening and were inescapable. Mm. And so I initiated any form of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, often just freeze, where I just stayed inside of these systems and said nothing about my doubts, my concerns, my fears, because then you would be disobedient, right? So <laughs> yeah. there's all these things that happen that just were happening and upheld the institution. And now the internet exists. You knew a quick Google. Now, a lot of these, um, a lot of the things that were previously reserved for academic work and academic research into the nature of trauma, you can go to a library and pick up a book by Peter Levine and can read all about trauma and all about the impacts. And what I, what I think is happening is a larger version of what happened with me when I started researching this stuff and realized this parallel line between the abuse from my mother and my experience inside of religion. And I was like, oh, well, I guess the word abuse applies here then. Yeah. And it, I, it was around that time that I learned about the terminology of religious trauma syndrome, which was coined by Dr. Marlene Winnell. And she wrote a book called Leaving the Fold in 1992, which is crazy. Wow. That book is only a little bit younger than me. And this terminology has been around for so long most of us just didn't have access to it. So I think being able to do that research and learn about that on your own is incredibly helpful. And then also hearing other people's stories, listening to podcasts and reading people's books and just coming across um, 
you know, there's hashtags on Twitter that you can click on and see all these people sharing all these stories about empty the pews. And there's a one that came out recently was jump the arc, <laughs> like jumping off. The, it, was, it was good. So all these people are sharing these stories about like why we left and our life now on the other side. Like, oh, I jumped the arc. You told me I would drown, but I'm thriving out mm. here. Like these threats won't work. So I think the way in which a lot of people can probably pinpoint their experience of trauma inside the religious institution for the most part is just gathering other people's stories unto themselves and giving themselves the permission to see their experience in the stories other people are telling and think about validating. I think we do this thing to ourselves a lot where we're like, well, man, that sounds hard for you, but like, I'm fine. Like we don't validate our own experiences as traumatizing because we're like, well, I lived through it. I'm okay. Most people live through and survive their trauma. It doesn't mean it didn't harmfully impact them. Yeah. And I think we are driven more often to validate someone else's experience and story than validate our own. And so if you can inundate yourself with other people's experiences and stories and good academic research, you're like two seconds away from being able to tell yourself the truth about what actually happened to you and being able to find healing and support. Right. And something we neglect to realize too is that you hold trauma in your body. Mm -hmm. So even if you won't acknowledge the truth of your story, your body knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how would how does that typically manifest for people? There's a lot. I go into it in the book. There's lists. I remember giving the presentation at my graduation and typing it out into my little PowerPoint and having to leave so many symptoms out mm. because the, t- the typing would have been too small on my screen that you wouldn't have been able to see it in the room because wow. there's so many symptoms. So, I mean, really classic symptoms of um, PTSD and complex PTSD, which the reason why complex PTSD and religious trauma syndrome are, can be so hard to nail down is because a lot of times um, the symptoms and indicators of experiencing complex PTSD um, can be classified as something else. Um, that's a big reason why CPTSD isn't even in the DSM yet is because for the most part, and this is something that Bessel van der Kolk talks about in the body keeps a score with his research into adverse childhood experiences where from his perspective, unless I'm gathering it incorrectly from him, it's a lot of, um, you can't, there are somatic modalities to help you heal from complex PTSD, but there are pharmaceuticals you can prescribe for someone who's dealing with bipolar disorder or someone who's dealing with borderline personality disorder, um, which a lot of the symptoms involved in those, um, in those diagnoses mirror complex PTSD. And so a lot of his research, um, lines up really well with a lot of what Marlene Winnell has talked about. And you see for me, it, I thought I had a lot of things that a good therapist told me Uh at a certain point (laughs) you don't actually have, you're just traumatized. Uh Um, but it, what actually got me out of church was intense panic attacks. So for me, it was a lot of anxiety. It was a lot of panic. Um, a lot of stuff that manifested in my gastrointestinal, like I had a lot of gastrointestinal issues. Um, for a lot of people, they'll notice just certain, um, I think gastrointestinal issues are big for people because like our gut is, is so connected to our brains and so connected to our, um, felt sense of like safety and anxiety that our guts will talk to us a lot. Um, and so for me, that was definitely happening. And I would, once I started to kind of, uh, tell myself the truth about my religious experience and simultaneously was still trying to put myself inside of religious spaces, I would make it about a minute, two minutes inside of these religious spaces before I would start having a panic attack so intense that I couldn't stay in the room. And every single time when I literally physically left the building and went outside, usually went outside and like took my shoes off, put my feet in the grass and like found God there. Um, that's the only way in which the panic attacks would leave. Wow. So the longer I tried to stay in the building, they wouldn't budge. And then when I would go outside and leave the building, they'd go away. And after the third or fourth time of that happening, something just clicked for me. And I was like, you body are clearly trying to talk to me about something. I can just stop putting you in this environment because I need to figure out what it is you're trying to say, what it is that's going on. And it was not long after that, that I was like, oh, I see where all these things match up. I need to not ever go back into one of those buildings, at least right now. Yeah. I don't know what will happen in the future, but as for right now, my body has not given me any indicator. I still experience anxiety when I'm inside religious spaces still. 
I do too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. It's pretty common. Mm -hmm. It is really common. I know. And yeah, I, I think that is such a beautiful thing to bring up because this to me is why it's so crucial and essential that we stop vilifying our Mm -hmm. minds and bodies. If we believe that we are created by a divine creator, then he created every aspect of us. Mm -hmm. And that would include our beautiful intellect and our beautiful self healing, restoring forms that we're in our Mm -hmm. vessels that are carrying us through this world. So if your vessel is screaming at you, you know, the Bible itself, take that, honor Mm -hmm. your body. Like if you feel your temple isn't being honored because Mm -hmm. it's starting to shake, because you're starting Mm -hmm. to cry, because you're feeling fear and anxiety, don't dishonor the temple that you're in. Don't dishonor your intellect or ignore it because all the answers you have are there. And I've said for a long time, I remember I was at this really, um, I'm starting to call people out by name, um, Oasis Church in mm-hmm. Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I was like self-comforting again when I said that because I, I that. feel yeah. weird calling yeah. people out. But, you know, I have a lot of friends that were harmed by that yes. community, um, primarily in the LGBTQ community. You shouldn't be afraid to tell the truth about their behavior. Like yeah. they, they need to own the behavior. <laughs> yeah, they do. And they need to own the doctrine that they're still yes. professing. Yep. You guys are not LGBTQ affirming. Yep. Get it off your website. Yep. <laughs> It's okay. Yep. Just own it. If that's mm-hmm. what you believe, say it. Yeah. But anyway, I remember feeling very controlled by the systems that they had in place. Mm-hmm. We had to sign a contract because I was on the worship Ugh. team. So the contract was, you know, like no premarital sex, yep. no alcohol in excess, no drug use, da, 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 da. And, um, and, you know, even that's fine if you want to have an environment where people are subscribing to a certain mm-hmm. set of rules that you believe are your principles, fine, yeah. like stick by them. But I just always felt that regimented thing when I was in that place. And yeah. I was always like self-restricting and feeling guilty and, you yep. know, all of that stuff that comes with yep. signing a document like that while Ooh. also coming into your womanhood in your yeah, 20s. Absolutely. You know, it's yeah. really conflicting. Yeah. Um, but that said, I remember getting all these messages all the time. And one time, and I wish I knew the pastor's name, this guy came in and I remember he went into this whole like long spiel about Mm -hmm. the majesty of the universe. Like he started with the building that we're in and he like zooms Mm -hmm. out and goes into the continent that we're in and then zooms out into planet earth and then all the stars and how many light years it takes to travel to a certain planet or to a certain star. And in conclusion, he goes, so we don't know anything and I don't know anything. And he's like, I am going to present to you a message. And if it resonates, take it home and, you know, chew it up and enjoy it. If it doesn't resonate, remember that I am just a man and I'm trying my best and maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And I never in my life heard a pastor give a congregation permission Mm -hmm. to trust themselves. I've never heard. This is the first time I've ever heard anyone even tell me a story where they were on the receiving end of that. I wish I knew his name. I really wish, but I I remember it more than anything I've ever heard. And I was stunned. And I remember I looked at the head pastor and I was like, Oh, what's on his face right now? Because it was just like, what did he just say? I wonder how comfortable he was with that. Yeah. I don't remember what, I mean, I can't presume to know what he thought in that moment. That's not fair. But like, I just remember being like, "Mm, he just contradicted the hell out of this whole thing. That feels so subversive (laughs) and so badass. I know I was, I was in love with it, but that is a huge thing that I talk about all the time on God is gray and almost every video I can interject it in. And when people ask me for advice too, I'm like, my primary advice is remember that if you believe you were given the Holy spirit, this direct channel to God, that you are allowed to trust yourself. You are allowed to hear that you can be with that boyfriend that you love, that treats you like gold, even though your aunt Becky is saying that you're unevenly yoked. Mm -hmm. Stop it. I wish 24 year old me could have heard (laughs) you say exactly that. Because I put a sweet man through hell for years because I was so internally conflicted because he wasn't a Christian. He was like the nicest human being I've ever met. 
but I was so obsessed with those rules. Yeah. And I bet it edified you in so many ways if you just had, Mm -hmm. and I'm in an unevenly yoked relationship now with the healthiest, most wonderful dynamic I've ever been in my life. And I, when I talk about that, I'm going to talk about the fact that we were sitting on my living room couch together when I believe God divinely gave me the idea for God is gray. Wow. So I'm like, don't get out of my face saying that he's not unevenly yoked yeah. with me. This yep. person does nothing but edify me. Yes. I mean, this is a whole other tangent, but yep. the point is trust yourself Yes. because you have the Holy spirit in you. If that's what you yes. really believe. Yes. And I, I do think that I don't, again, kind of coming back to this point, I don't understand how we have distilled the message of Jesus the Christ into anything other than you have the spirit. The spirit lives not only, it doesn't, the spirit doesn't dwell in some weird ethereal part of you that is compartmentalized inside your physical body and only kind of it. The spirit is in your body. Yeah. So trust the messages of your body. That is, that is part of Christ consciousness is Mm -hmm. trust the messages of your body. I love that. Yeah. I've already said before I could talk to you for 19 hours and I'm so sure nice. everyone would actually listen the to it. The funny part is, is we already <laughs> talked for almost two hours before we started recording. So clearly we could do this for a while. Yeah. I love it. And I also just want to reiterate to you guys a million more times that we still just scratch the surface of Jamie's mm-hmm. book. I really, really hope and pray that you'll get yourself a copy and it's for anyone and everyone. You don't even, if you're fascinated by Christianity and you're like, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> it's a great book for you. Yes. If you are coming out of it. And the last bit of terminology I want to touch on for one second mm-hmm. is it brought me a lot of peace to understand what I called my 12 year journey and my tramp page and my leaving mm-hmm. the church was me, my coming of age, you know, teen flick yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But really what we're calling it now which feels good is deconstruction, which isn't that you are abandoning your faith, Mm -hmm. abandoning Jesus headed towards hell. You're actually just dismantling Mm -hmm. anything that's harmed you. And you have every right to do that. Can I get an amen? Absolutely. (laughs) A fucking man. And then some people stop there because they're like, Oh wow, this is profound. And I realize this is not for me. But then others of us, myself mm-hmm. included, go then on the path of reconstruction, yes. which is then realizing how you're piecing the pieces mm-hmm. of your body and your spirit and your mind back together again. So you're coming to God in a holistic way yep. instead of in all these scraps. Mm-hmm. And you're also figuring out how your doctrine works mm-hmm. when the Bible says something crazy racist mm-hmm. or you know crazy misogynistic. That's reconstruction Mm -hmm. when you're trying to figure that out, which is what I'm presenting to you guys on God is Gray. Yeah. And no matter where you are in that process of deconstruction or reconstruction, you are following the spirit, following the Christ, and you are listening to your body in that entire process. There's no destination to it. I think everybody reconstructs into something, um, but not everybody always reconstructs into some version of Christianity or even maybe even something that looks overtly spiritual and that's okay. It's all okay. No matter where you are in that process, like honor the information your body is giving you about what you need. Yeah. And honor the authenticity of that. I know it it probably sounds really scary for someone to hear you Mm -hmm. might not come back. Yeah. That would have scared the hell out of me. Yeah. Same. But if you do come back, you'll come back with the most most authenticity mm-hmm. you'll ever experience in your yeah. faith. Yeah. And, and you'll come back to a God that you don't need to be afraid of because you've learned mm. truly, truly, truly through that deconstruction, reconstruction process that maybe the Bible was right all along and there is no fear in love. <laughs> Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Do you have any final thoughts? No, this has just been so wonderful. <laughs> so great. Uh, My final thought is that I want to do this again tomorrow, but (laughs) as soon as possible. And it's been so lovely. Thank you. Well, yeah, if you're on the same page, Mm -hmm. love to have you back. I'm sure we can dive into more specific topics. Mm -hmm. If you guys were specifically interested in anything we said, please write Jamie or I and Mm -hmm. be like, I need you guys to Mm -hmm. meet up again and talk about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on all, my website is jamieleefinch.com. I'm on all social media as either you can just search Jamie Lee Finch or on Instagram. It's at I am Jamie Lee Finch because Instagram kicked me off from my book. 
which is super fun, but it's okay. That's a whole story for another time. But don't even get me started. But you can read it. You can have it. That's the good news. You can have it for your very own. But yeah. um, Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to talk with all of you and meet all of you. That's awesome. Go follow Jamie. Buy this book. I'll say it a million more times. Um, And that's it. We love you guys. God bless.